I had the, the opportunity and, and privilege of working with the Aspen Institute on the uh, project play reports for Rochester, <coughs> Detroit, and Buffalo um, over the last eight or nine months. And, and one of the real revelations of that process was learning about the creativity and innovation going on in these communities with respect to bringing play spaces closer to kids. I wanted to just share with you one example. In Rochester, Teresa's hometown, um, the Sully Branch Library in the city of Rochester has a program by which kids can walk into the library, present their library card, and walk out with a fishing rod or a basketball. And a very simple idea and one that's scalable, I mean, any public library could do it. We'd never heard of anything like that. A public library that checked out fishing rods. So we're going to hear about other innovative programs um, over the next 30 minutes. And, and let's start with Teresa. Tell us about Conky Cruisers and, and the origins of the idea. Where did it come from? In order to really understand Conkey Cruisers, I first have to introduce you to Conkey Avenue, which is a street in Rochester that is best described is not on the top 10 places you should visit when you come to <laughs> Rochester. It just happens to be the neighborhood that I call home. And on one particular day, I was jogging down the street. You know, I was trying to get fit and I was losing weight. And by then I was getting it in. So I'm jogging down the street. And this kid says, hey, lady, are you on probation? <laughs> Stop me right in my tracks. I'm like, huh? The little boy thought that I was running from the police. I'm just exercising. So that thought was like burning in my brain. And I went on to my journey. And now I was on another street, Joseph Avenue, which also does not make the list of the top 10 neighborhoods you should visit when you come to Rochester. And I stopped to chat with some neighbors. And a gentleman walked up and he said, don't talk to her. I'm like, don't talk to me? He's like, no, don't talk to her. She's the police. I said, I am not the police. I'm a nurse. He said, don't be fooled by her and her jogging clothes. She is the police because don't nobody exercise in this neighborhood. I said, okay, Lord, what's the assignment? <laughs> there must be something that you would have me to do if a little child thinks that I'm running from the police and this grown man thinks that I am the police. We have an issue that goes generations. We have missed the boat across the lifespan. And so I went back and said, okay, I'll, I'll do it through bicycling. Because if you heard a lot of the speakers today from the WNBA, from Major League Baseball, they all talked about being on a bicycle. So I knew that cycling would be attractive. I didn't have no bikes. I had no money. I had nothing but the passion to do something about this day that I had in Rochester. Fast forward, I was able to pitch my story to a number of people, stakeholders in Rochester, and from that day forward, donations started to roll in. But I didn't have any place to put the bikes, but I owned a house. So I took all the furniture out of the living room and put all the bikes in the living room, and the volunteers to start Conky Cruisers would come to my house ride the bicycles up to the park, and we started a program. I was like, well, who's going to come? I just canvassed the neighborhood with flyers. 112 people showed up the first year, and every year after that, we just completed our sixth year. Over 100 people came to be a part of Conkey Cruisers Bicycling to Better Health Voyage with our mission and vision was to pursue a healthy lifestyle through cycling. And now you even have your own leisure wear line. I know, check it out. I know. I like it. It's like, I like it. We didn't have t-shirts the first year. Like I literally had no money. So how do you start a bicycling program with no, no money, with no funds? It's basically pitching your story to somebody that has a shared vision for changing your community in the same way in which you choose to, to, to change it. And that's why we've been able to be successful for six years and every year after. And if you walk on any street in Rochester and just mention the word cocky cruisers, somebody will lead you to me. Any street. Does, do the shirts come in, in men's large? <laughs> oh, absolutely. We have okay. all sizes. <laughs> okay. I'll get back to you after the panel. Ed, tell us about the, the mini pitch program. So the mini pitch program is our effort at the U.S. Soccer Foundation to create safe play spaces for kids right in the neighborhoods where they live, particularly underserved communities, uh, which is our primary focus. 
Uh, the genesis of it actually started around eight years ago uh, when the foundation's board of directors agreed with the idea to shift our focus to underserved communities which hadn't had access to the game and had not grown with the game of soccer in the country, which as you all know has grown rapidly, um, but low income communities had not had participated at the rate that we wanted. And when we made that commitment, uh, the many pitches stemmed out of programming. We started free after school programming for children in those communities, evidence-based programming, and then quickly realized that kids needed a safe place to play. Having the programming wasn't enough, that we needed to create um, access to play spaces. And we settled on mini pitches, as w which I'll describe as 7,200 square feet, about the same size as a tennis court, uh, same surface as a tennis court, um, ideally placed right in the neighborhood where children live, on a schoolyard, a neighborhood park, some place that is easily accessible to children so that they have access, has permanent goals. Uh, they look really cool because they're colorful and really attractive um, in the space. And they are transformative in those neighborhoods. And the key being is, I think you were citing some um, uh, statistics earlier about the lack of access to play spaces and recreation spaces in underserved communities. Um, that to address that, we made a commitment to do our work right where children live, as opposed to uh, creating something wonderful someplace else um, that they had no way of getting to. Um, I give the, uh, the analogy often of, um, we do a lot of work in New York City. Uh, Randall's Island, if you're familiar with New York City, is a wonderful <coughs> park space with dozens of playing fields. And the kids in Harlem can see it you know, across the water, but they can't get there. Um, and so, Creating those kinds of wonderful destinations is great for those folks who can get there, but we also have to have an equal commitment to building play spaces right in the neighborhoods where children live so that they have easy access. I grew up in New York playing basketball. Whenever I wanted to play basketball, I walked out of my house down to the corner of the school, and there was a basketball court. Or I walked to whatever neighborhood park, there was a basketball court. You know, rims, the whole deal. Uh, and we need the same thing for kids to have access um, to soccer in those communities. So how many mini pitches at this point? It's 80? So we built 84 uh, mini pitches to date. Um, but we have funding in place to build over 200 over the next three years. Uh, and uh, thanks in large part to a re recent support from Target, uh, which uh, really um, shows a commitment to this issue of creating access to play spaces. They committed to supporting the building of 100 of these mini pitches around the country. Uh, and we are very excited to get moving with that project and to you know, transform communities. Because at the end of the day, it's not just a place to play soccer. It is a place that is trans a transformative hub in the community. When you take a dead space and create, turn it into a play space, you change the tenor of the neighboring community. People begin to think about the space differently. Um, community members come out to watch their children play because it's something different and something new. Uh, one of the things that's most exciting to us is that um, the California Endowment commissioned a case study on a project we did in South Los Angeles. Uh, and what was really fascinating about it, we built a play space in a very tough neighborhood of Los Angeles, like, and uh, where murders and other things happen on a not a uh, irregular basis. Um, but the fact of the matter is by creating this play space and then activating it with programming, it transformed the, the surrounding community because then grandma came out to watch the kids and mom came out to walk around the field just the way moms walk around the field in, in my suburban Virginia neighborhood because it's a, a safe place for them to be because there's an activation around this play space that then changes the whole dynamic in the neighborhood. A simple idea and a relatively inexpensive idea too, but profound in, in the effect it can have on a community. Yes, and that's the key. Um, we can, you can do a lot of different things, um, but when you can come up with a low cost, high impact solution that you can scale, because scale is really important. At the end of the day, you can do something, a one-off, that has tremendous impact in one neighborhood, but how do you come up with solutions that are scalable to address the scale of the problem. Yeah. The problem is tremendous. There are 15 million children in this country living in poverty. 
That's a big problem. And so you have to have solutions that are low cost and high impact and that can be scaled across you know, a wide area and reach as many children as possible. And, and I hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about scaling because everybody in this room will have a mini pitch in their community eventually. Eventually. <laughs> uh, but we want to we want to inspire that kind of thinking. Exactly. So Mike Lanza, um, I, I learned about Mike Lanza in 2016 when he was on, I believe, the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Not quite the cover. <laughs> when he was on page eight of the New York Times Sunday Magazine, <laughs> it was this remarkable profile of a man who is either an anarchist or a revolutionary. I couldn't decide which one. Both. Um, but thinks in a very different way about kids and play. And, and Mike, uh, explain to us what Playborhood is all about. Uh, Playborhood is about trying to uh, help parents figure out how to give kids a, a life of neighborhood play, independent neighborhood play, where eventually parents aren't around, where adults aren't around. Um, when we started talking about this, we, we asked, uh, you know, how did you get to this idea? Well, I remember when my wife was pregnant with our first child uh, about 13 years ago, and I started really listening to parent-child interactions, and I heard uh, an argument between a, a friend of mine and his son, and basically the argument, argument revolved around the schedule, what I have to do this time, that time, this soccer practice, and I said, why doesn't he just go out and play? And my friend, he killed me, he said, kids don't go outside and play anymore. And I thought back to my childhood, what were the most fun things, fun moments of my childhood? They all had to do with me and my friends playing in our neighborhood without any adults around. And so uh, the mission of Playborhood is to try to figure out how to, how to create, how to change culture of children, change parenting culture to give, uh, to, to get that rolling. And it's really difficult to, to change culture of, of kids in neighborhoods, but to make it, change it so that kids will go outside and play independently in their neighborhoods. And, um, you know, we, I happen to live in an affluent neighborhood in California, in Menlo Park, uh, home of Facebook, uh, but uh, I've gone out and done research in all sorts of neighborhoods throughout the United States where it's working. And uh, there are some very eclectic places, but the idea behind Playborhood is grassroots to make it happen right outside their front doors. Uh, there's a, a interesting research that says that most kids, uh, over 50% of kids under, say, the age of 10, I don't know the exact statistics, uh, but something like that, aren't allowed outside of their yard or their <coughs> courtyard or their apartment complex. So uh, I'm kind of radical. I think we need to bring play spaces outside the front door of kids. Um, I don't know if parks will ever get there. So really, the idea of Playborhood is um, making play spaces happen right outside kids' front doors and back doors and making it a place where kids will eventually be able to do it without adults around and making up all sorts of crazy wild games that um, most people here, if you're in your official capacity, wouldn't call sports, but really are sports. They're competitive, they make their own rules, um, they do things on their own, and they work really hard at it. Um, and I've seen it, I've seen it in a lot of places. So you walk the walk. This is not just a speech that you, yeah. that you give. If I, I, if I knocked on your door in Menlo Park and you opened the door, what, what would I see in your well, house and well, your Well, first of all, you wouldn't get to the front door because, quite honestly, um, <clears throat> and this was not true of our neighborhood before we moved in uh, about uh, 11 years ago or 10 years ago, but it is true now. Uh, there are kids at our house every day, pretty much every, all the time from after school until the sun goes down. Um, and that's something that we've, that I've really consciously engendered. And I, could, I will say that there are other neighborhoods that we've, we've visited that I've done research on that are like this. But you wouldn't get to the front door because there's craziness happening everywhere from the moment you get within about 50 feet of our house. And you encourage that. You want craziness in, in your house. Not only craziness, but one radical idea is, and, you know, we live in the suburbs, you know, kind of hoity-toity with nice shrubs and all that stuff. Um, we tell parents and kids very clearly come here and play anytime, whether we're there or not. And they come. And it, it didn't happen right away. It's, it's been a long process. But we have kids. We, we get home. Sometimes we're out. We get home. Almost always there's someone playing in our yard. Um, because, uh, you know, from the point of view of a suburban adult, uh, you know, we want to have our privacy. Kids want kids playing. They want kids around. Uh, and uh, that's what we've got going. And it's very important. We have to make it uh, a situation where 
If a kid decides to put down their video game, put down their iPhone, and come to our house, there's got to be something going on. If there's not something going on, they're not going to come back. So uh, it's very clearly a place where there's something happening all the time. It's a kid hangout. Okay, we'll come back. We, we actually have some video <laughs> taken at your home. It's, I'm a little frightened about this, but we're, <laughs> we're going to watch it. Kevin O'Hara, talk to us about the, the concept of pocket parks, the idea of taking a quarter of an acre, yeah. sometimes less than a quarter of an acre, and turning it into yeah. a community resource. Well, I think I want to place it into context of a, a little bit of sort of the, the role of the built environment uh, writ large in our country. Uh, I think about bicycling, I think about soccer, I think about play, and I think about how we have basically engineered walking and biking and mobility out of our daily lives in most places in this country. Um, so whether it's a pocket park, whether it's a striped bike lane, whether it's a pop-up park, whether it's um, small things that we in the nerdy urban planning world call tactical urbanism, um, pop-up things, things that excite people, things that bring people outside of their homes and bring them together. So we talked about community cohesion, we talked about neighborhood activ activation, we talked about a lot of these things already. But it's critical that I think parks and recreation agencies and city planners and others need to be thinking about how do we re-engineer our cities and our communities to foster those interactions with each other in the public realm. Now, we think that happens at parks all over the places. But if you can't get to that park, because there's a six lane highway in the way, or there's not even a, a, a pedestrian crossing, how good is that park if you, if you can't access it without an automobile? So I think we're working on some things called Safe Routes to Parks, a national 10 minute walk to a park campaign that's gonna think about how do we bring that mobility, that people-based mobility back into our lives? How do we uh, re-engineer our cities to allow for those, those interactions with each other in the public realm? Um, pocket parks are just one way to do that. I think Teresa's example on, on, on Conky Cruisers is indicative of a larger bike and walk movement that's happening in this country where we're reclaiming the public realm for people, um, whether that's the Ciclovia in Guadalajara, Mexico, or temporary uh, play streets in Philadelphia. Um, I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of uh, momentum behind making uh, the pu putting the public back in that public realm, putting it people first rather than, than automobile first. And I think that's something that um, everybody here is, is, is working towards. And uh, your local park and rec agency wants to help you and your community you know, get to that. So one of the things I'm struck with in all of your stories is that these ideas are within the reach of virtually every community. Mm -hmm. that, that, of course, funding is a barrier, but it, the amount of money required is not you know, unattainable. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to, to us about funding? What, what is it, what's the annual budget of Conkey Cruisers? If it's a really, really good year, then I have begged up about $20,000, and that's pretty much how it goes. And I literally go out, a lot of those people are in this room that have gotten those requests for donations to Conkey Cruisers. And where the bulk of that money comes from is just community organizations, the Walmart, the Community Foundation, Greater Foundation, Greater Rochester Health Foundation, the pharmacy, the churches, like all the places that you think that may not give you a donation, but if you got 20 friends and they all give you $100, then you got a chunk of money that you can now work with. And so there is no stone that I don't turn over and see what's under there to provide for this program because the outcomes mean that much. Um, two years ago, we got robbed and all the bikes got stolen. At that point, we had 150 bikes in our storage. And it was kind of a mixed blessing in that the community just came and outpoured and they stole 150 bikes and we got 503 bikes back. But from that, <laughs> The Community Foundation called me up, and came in and said, we'd like you to install some new security. We want you to put in a security system that you can look on your cell phone and a big tall gate and all these wonderful security measures, right? I thought this was the best thing since sliced bread. A security system? Well, to maintain a security system, you gotta have rg and &E, which is our electricity. You have to have power, that costs money. So now we have costs that we didn't initially have when we started the program. So without 
any kid getting on a bicycle now, I need $11,000 to pay for all the stuff. And then the way our program works, because it's a six week summer program, and at the end of the six weeks, each person that complete the program get a brand new bike. Because I need you to keep riding even when we're not in session. So a lot of our cost is the prize bikes, the food, because each day I like to incorporate a healthy snack, non-sweetened beverages, and then we do one of my favorite activities is we go to the grocery store and we feed a family on $5. Every participant ride their bike to the grocery store, they get $5, they go into the store, and they're taught how to come out with a healthy meal that includes a fresh fruit or fresh, a fresh fruit or fresh vegetable, and it has to be something that you like. Like, don't go get tuna fish and nothing else, because you probably wouldn't have just tuna and nothing else for a meal. And so when I look at the creativity and all the lessons that I can teach someone in a neighborhood that's struggling with stretching food dollars, where we have high <coughs> rates of poverty, and now I've showed you, taught you, you learn, and we learn together how to stretch food dollars. So if you got five dollars, what are you buying? Probably ice cream cone. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no ice cream cones. No ice cream cones. But now we've learned, now you have a valuable skill that even when you're not riding your bike with Conky Cruisers, look what you have. In the, the store where the neighborhood where we operate, a gallon of milk is five dollars, a box of generic cereal is four dollars. But when you get on your bicycle and ride the three miles down to our Wegmans food market, I'm from Rochester, it's the best food store ever. Mm -hmm. Then look all the variety that's now open to you. Look at all the fresh fruits, all the vegetables. If you would like to have meat, the butcher is your best friend. Why? Because you only need to get the portion that you need. You can get a half a dozen eggs. You don't have to get the whole dozen. You get a half a loaf of bread or a half a gallon of milk. And so now we're looking at stretching our food dollars in ways that we've never thought about stretching them before because we're taught to think big. Mm -hmm. But if you only have $5 and you're responsible for feeding the family, it can be done. You got $20,000. I do. I do. <laughs> Any other stones? I need, I need to go to my car to get it. I'll do that. Ed, um, how much? Start to finish to put in the, the mini pitches. That, that you the standard done. mini pitch we put in cost sixty thousand dollars, and for us to manage the project and put the mini pitch in, and you know from soup to nuts. Um, but you know, I think that the I want to piggyback on something that that was just shared by Teresa. She mentioned the word outcomes, right? And when you talk about sustainable programming over time, outcomes are essential. I can say playing soccer is great for kids and it's all wonderful, but without outcomes to back that up, to be able to show to funders, government decision makers and others, corporations, that your investment in this work actually addresses needs that you have, not just soccer needs, but that it improves health outcomes, it improves social outcomes and those kinds of things. I think those are the keys to scale um, when you can show that there's a measurable impact of the work, it's easier to build a coalition of supporters around that work over a long-term basis. Mike. So you stop, mentioned. Stop, okay. because we're going to show a video. Oh, OK. <laughs> I show the video of your home. Shield your eyes if you're concerned about this. <laughs> um, so can we cue that up? <laughs> oh, my God! Yes! No, no, over, no, over. <laughs> yeah. Go go over. It didn't go over. It didn't go over. You serve. You serve. Go really closely, y'all. Sixteen crowns. There you go. So that looks a lot like kids having fun to me. And not only is the kids having fun, but it's kids figuring out what to play, where to play it. They make up their own rules because... You know, what is out of bounds, what's in bounds, how do you decide, uh, you know, when there's a dispute, uh, did, did the ball go over the net or not? Um, uh, and also, you notice, you may not have noticed, uh, my, that's my sons, my three sons there. Uh, the boy on the right, Marco, he's playing on his knees. Why is he playing on his knees? Because he decided on his own, in order to get his brothers to play with him, he was going to have to handicap himself because he's bigger, he's older. So he's thinking about equity. He's thinking about how can I make a level playing field? Now, what do kids do when they play club sports, when they play 
um, uh, you know, a, a league sports. Um, everything is controlled by adults. So all these things that we want kids to do when they grow up, all these things, we want them to make the, be creative, decide what they're going to do. They, we want them to make rules. We want them to make laws. We want them to adjudicate disputes. We want them to create an egalitarian uh, situation where kids who have different needs are all accommodated. Uh, these kids are doing that on an everyday basis. And it doesn't happen in league sports, and te in team sports. It just doesn't happen. It's not to say I, don't, I hate team sports, but I really think this sort of thing needs to happen, uh, not just for athletics, not just for cardiovascular health, but for learning how to be leaders, learning how to, how to make society a better place. And this seems like a pretty inexpensive model. Well, yes, and there's a lot that goes into creating that culture so that they're happier being outside than, than they are inside playing on screens. Uh, there's a lot that happens, but once we get that going, um, they do a lot of crazy stuff, and a lot of us can remember playing pig and horse and you know, coming up with the craziest shots from behind the backboard. Uh, these kids are doing things like that every day. Can I, can I just jump in on this particular point? Because I think uh, one of the things, our work is focused on underserved communities, and I can't overstate how big a factor safety or the perception of safety is for kids just going outside and doing the things um, that we grew up doing. Um, there is a, per a perception of a lack of safety in which parents are reluctant unless there is some sort of structure that they feel that their child is going to be safe. Um, and so we have to be mindful that just saying go outside and play is nice and nostalgic. But the reality is for many, many children, um, unless we can create a safe environment that their parents feel safe for them, then that's going to be a very challenging thing to overcome. Well, I, I would say we have a deep cultural problem mm -hmm. that uh, this notion that kids cannot enjoy themselves without rules and structure and, and adults around is just very detrimental to children's development. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to acknowledge that, but I would say, I, from my point of view, we need to fight that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. let's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let's, let's speak about pocket parks in that context, in the context yeah. of safety. Right, well, I'll think about it and then add the layer of, uh, of talk about funding. So I'm a big playground guy now because I have two little kids and I never was a, I was always a park guy, like going hiking and stuff. Now I have two kids, I'm a playground guy now. <laughs> Love playgrounds. Um, they're redoing my playground in Petworth in Northwest Washington. It's going to cost $2.7 million to redo the playground. So I want to just maybe be the wet blanket here to say that parks and recreation infrastructure is infrastructure. And it does cost money. And I think there is a role for the public sector to play in making investments in this critical infrastructure. And it sends signals to the community. If you have a, a playground, and, and I see our friends in Target are working with them on redoing playgrounds and playscapes across the country, that sends a signal to communities. It's an equity issue. It's a, it's a safety issue. It goes to a lot of those things that if my city is willing to invest in my park or my recreation center, that's going to redesign it to make it beautiful, to make it attractive, and to program it to the extent that, that it needs to be programming. That sends a signal to communities. Now, the flip side of that is some communities say, oh, good, the city's going to spend $2.7 million. There we go. That sends a signal to developers saying, boom, 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 this is the next round of uh, gentrification coming to this community. So we see places across the country that are resisting these investments in resisting the kind of park equity movement that we're seeing in Los Angeles, New York, and communities across the country saying, hey, 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 back it up. We don't want your park equity because that sends a signal to developers and to gentrifiers that this neighborhood is now open for business. So again, I go back to the, the role of community engagement of, of, of uh, of doing that ground up, bottom up approach to make sure that we're making these investments based on community need, based on community buy-in, community commitment, and that they're aware of these investments that are being made because the public investment has to be there in order to have equitable access to green space in this country. And, but and we need to engage the community before that process starts so they are prepared to be a partner to the, to the progress. And, and gentrification is an important issue, I think, generally, but particularly for this panel. How do we ensure that these play spaces that we're bringing into communities for the benefit of kids who would otherwise not have access ultimately are being used by the, or, or those kids have that access 
We have a video on this subject mm -hmm. that um, this is a, a real, this is not staged, and it illustrates this conflict that can exist between um, adults with uh, resources and kids who have, you know, live in the community and can't get onto these fields because of the competition for play space. So we can see 65. that. Homies are playing. They're waiting for the field at seven. It's about to go down. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you do. There is no seven to eight. Anyway. If you want to play pickup, you play pickup like the rest of us. It's not pickup. You can book the fucking field. field. You can book the field. field. Just because you got money and you can pay for the field, you don't get to book for an hour to take it's over these kids' fucking lives. It's kind of bullshit. No, it's bullshit. It's going to say you're not going to pay for it. It's like the nueva. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. The paper. For the rent, you know? I don't have it. Connor has it. Who's Connor? So the body, so the two comes, then the car gets the field. Let me see. 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 Let me see your paper yeah, okay, you, you can do it one hour or two hours, wherever you want to do it. Our friend Hunter, he's not here yet. Yo, you, you don't understand. You don't understand. It's not about the field. It, 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 it doesn't matter. This field has never been booked. Well, okay, matter. you don't understand. So, this field well, has you never been booked. How long have you been in the neighborhood, bro? How long have you been in the neighborhood? Who gives a shit who? Over a year. Who cares about the neighborhood? Oh my god. How long have you been playing here for? Because my whole life, like I've been born and raised here for 20 years, and my whole life, we've been You can share. One time, you let other people play. We will share with you. Why don't you get a team, and we play pick up stuff, and we sell them like it always. Is it a ball hockey or a ball hockey? Is it a ball hockey or a ball hockey? There is no permit. It does not matter if there's a piece of paper. Why don't we all just play? I would love to play. Let's do that. Then let's play. Then let's play. You got a team. We got a team. Let's play seven for seven. That's how it is. I think we have the idea. <laughs> uh, so the, these are real tensions. That, that's real life playing out. Um, so w what's the solution, Ed? How, how do you manage these kinds of conflicts? Well, I, I won't claim to have the solution to that problem. Um, but I will say that if you're thoughtful and mindful about these kinds of issues and questions from the beginning of a project, engaging the community, as, as Kevin was saying, um, ensuring that there's activated programming in place in those spaces that ensures that children and community members have access, equitable access to the space. I think it all starts there. You build it in to the project. You build it into the agreement with the school or with the, the government entity that you're working with that there will be access to free programming you know, during an X number of hours on a daily basis, et cetera, so that you can forestall these kinds of kind of conflicts uh, because it's very real. You hear the argument, the intensity of your argument, but you have to recognize that um, unless you put in protections for those who don't have resources or don't have the means, um, they, they, there is a good chance that they will be run off of a, off of a site. Yeah, I think we're going to have to, to cut it here and, and throw things open to, to questions. Um, do we have questions? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, we will be looking at the screen again for Slido. Um, the first question is, what is best practice re-bringing safe place, safe place spaces to life? What is key to success in finding sustainable partners to implement play in these spaces? Um, what worked for Khaki Cruisers is we gave ownership of the program to the community. Like it was, people take such pride in wearing the t-shirt and being a member of Khaki Cruisers. It's a label that people want to wear in a neighborhood that was considered a place that nobody exercised in. 
And the trail that we ride our bikes on was an old railroad track that they pulled up and put an urban trail. So we ride on the only urban trail in Rochester, but we made it a community program. So whenever there's refreshments, the whole neighborhood eats with Conkey Cruisers. When I have, each day that we meet to cycle, we have a DJ. And you say, well, what in the world do you need a DJ for in a bicycling program? Because it's a party that the whole community is invited to. Mm -hmm. When I have a banquet, I don't have enough budget money to have a big banquet. I put the banquet tables in the middle of the street. Ask the police to close off the street. Gotta have cloth tablecloths. That's a must. <laughs> it's a must. <laughs> And we have a banquet in the middle of the street with the DJ that the whole neighborhood is invited to. So now they own Conky Cruisers. And when it's yours, you don't want anything bad to happen to it. And so we have a certain level of protection now because we have that ownership. And that's what keeps the program going. And that's where we get the community buy-in. And we became partners with the people that we needed to make it work, with the city of Rochester. That's who will give us the permits. That's who allowed me to put five tractor trailer side storage units to now house over 250 bikes. So I had to make good and play nice. Like we talk about playing and play <laughs> spaces, but do we even know how to play nice anymore? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's the difference between, uh, what you're describing in, in my mind is, doing things to people or doing things with people, right? Mm -hmm. And doing things with people is the key. Um, when you work, engage the community, and you're bringing something that they agree that they want in the community, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, in South Central Los Angeles, for example, we started with programming, and then we followed that because there was a need for a safe place to play with a safe place to play. Then the parents in the community said, well, the kids are learning about healthy things to eat. Can you get a farmer's market to come on Fridays when the kids are practicing? Then the mom said, well, the kids are practicing. Can you get a Zumba class while, while the kids are practicing? Like, you begin, we forget that sport and are, are part of a healthy community. It's where neighbor meets neighbor, physical activities, where neighbor meets neighbor, where you find out things are going on in your community. You solve problems together. You hear about a problem, and you're talking to someone next to you on the sideline of a game, and you start to find a solution to that problem. So I think the doing things with people in communities is, is essential. If you come in with the idea that we're coming in with the solution, and here it is, and take it, and, and it's going to be great, um, that's not going to work. When you come into the community with the idea that, hey, here's some ideas of things that could be done in your community. What do you think? Do you like this? Do you want this? Then suddenly you get community buy-in, and then ownership of that space um, becomes their space, not, not your space. Important point. Yeah, I yeah. want to address that question and also get back to the resources question. Um, I think the most important uh, overlook thing, uh, from my perspective, from the Playhood perspective, is, uh, is parents' attention. It's much more important uh, where parents are, what they're doing with their time, rather than how much money they spend on this play facility or whether, what government spends. Uh, so, you know, Woody Allen has his famous quote that's often attributed to him, 80% of life is showing up. So where do parents show up? Do they show up in front of their television set? Do they show up, uh, you know, in front of their, their video game? Or are they outside in their neighborhoods, meeting neighbors, talking to neighbors? An interesting thing happens when, uh, when parents get out, they get walking with their kids, you get to know other parents, you get to know their kids, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, the neighborhood hasn't changed, but all of a sudden it feels safer because mm -hmm. you know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's really, I think, mostly about your attention and where you spend your time rather than how much money you spend. So our time is up. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna thank the panel for a great conversation. Thanks so much. Thank